Alice Saint-Rennes, in the heart of France. This small town was once the site of the stronghold of Elysia. It was here in the year 52 BC that Julius Caesar fought the decisive battle in his campaign to conquer Gaul. Surrounded and outnumbered by two armies, Caesar successfully achieved one of the most remarkable victories in history. Julius Caesar is the most famous of all Roman generals, yet first and foremost, he was a scheming, ambitious politician. He led Rome's armies only so that he could lead Rome. His conquests of Gaul and then of the Roman state itself changed the face of Western civilization. After Alexander the Great, Julius Caesar is undoubtedly the great giant as a soldier of the ancient world. He was considerably older than some generals by the time he got his opportunity. He was in his mid-forties, which in his times was getting on quite a lot in terms of age. He had, in fact, first served in a very junior capacity at the age of 19, but he'd never come to anything like a command position. But we have here in Caesar a general who is not only a great fighting man, but also a great historian, of course. His histories of the Gallic Wars and of the Civil Wars are models of the writing of military history, which to this day have a great influence. But here we have a man, very, very sophisticated in mind, whose main interest is really political rather than military. He is trying to build up a reputation through feet of arms which will enable him to dominate the Roman political scene. Caesar was born in Rome around 100 BC to an aristocratic family that had once enjoyed great wealth and power. He was a slightly built man with soft and white skin who suffered from headaches and was subject to epileptic fits. He was particular of his personal appearance and dress, was clean shaven and was sensitive of his premature balding. As the son of minor nobility, it was expected that he would enter the world of politics. At this time, Rome was the leading power of the ancient world, capital of an empire that circled the Mediterranean. It had become wealthy on the goods and slaves brought by foreign conquest. It had also become corrupt, its politicians forever conspiring to advance their careers. Rome developed a republican system of government with elected magistrates. These magistrates were drawn from a fairly limited number of aristocratic families. And the electorate was not completely free as we would understand it in a modern Western democracy today. What would happen is that the electorate consisted mainly of the dependents of the big noble families who formed alliances with each other to get their favoured candidates elected. So you had a system which depended on personal contacts, and influence, and later on, as Rome became very, very rich from her conquests, it came to depend more and more on payment of bribes to people to get them to vote the way you wanted. Caesar unscrupulously exploited this. A realist to his fingertips, not led astray by ideals and ideologies. He didn't mind temporarily groveling. In his 20s, he worked his way up the strict political hierarchy. When he was 31, he was appointed as an official to Rome's Spanish colony. It was there that coming upon a statue of Alexander the Great, Caesar is said to have wept with envy. Before Alexander had died, aged just 32, he had conquered most of the known world. 
Caesar felt that he, as yet, had achieved nothing. He returned to Rome, more determined than ever. His lavish bribes and a gift for oratory gradually paid off. He was elected to the Senate, the heart of Rome's political body. He was so profuse in his expenses that before he had any public employment, he was hugely in debt. And many thought by incurring such expenses, he changed a solid good for what would prove a short and uncertain return. But in truth, he was purchasing what was of greatest value at an inconsiderable rate. His ambitions went further than just the Senate. Through careful alliance with Crassus, Rome's wealthiest man, and Pompey, its leading general, he became, in 59 BC, aged 41, consul, one of Rome's two annual leaders. Caesar's co-consul, Bibulus, was intimidated into staying at home. Caesar was left to rule alone. His first act was to introduce a law to give land to soldiers. The Senate disapproved, so he used force, knowing that in the long run, the support of soldiers was more valuable than that of politicians. By the end of his year in office, having threatened and bullied his opponents, there were many in the Senate determined that Caesar should stand trial not only for abuse of power, but also theft. They claimed he had replaced the treasury's gold bars with fakes. Caesar, however, avoided trial by taking advantage of a privilege granted to ex-consuls, a governorship of one of the Roman provinces. As a governor, he would be immune from prosecution. He contrived to be assigned first Illyricum, a partially conquered province which offered him opportunities to acquire wealth through military expansion. And secondly, Cisalpine Gaul, which dominated Rome. No one in the Senate dared oppose these appointments. For we do not think resistance possible without a general slaughter. Increasingly powerful, he also took control on the death of its governor of Transalpine Gaul to the west. The Gauls were the most powerful and populous of a group of peoples who today we refer to as the ancient Celts, who lived not only in many parts of Western Europe and the British Isles, but also in quite a lot of Eastern Europe. These people shared much in common in their culture, in their art, and especially in their related languages. The Gauls themselves were particularly brilliant craftsmen, metal workers, and were exceptionally good at making weapons. They uh, also were, some of them anyway, moving towards the formation of quite powerful states, especially in central France when Julius Caesar arrived there. They were already constructing what we can only really describe as cities. They were themselves becoming uh, literate, and uh, they were also organizing their own governments and electing magistrates in a way not very dissimilar, really, from the Roman Republic. Much of Gaul, which stretched across what is now France and Belgium, remained beyond Rome's control. Caesar decided to conquer it. One has to remember with Caesar that everything he did was primarily for political reason. The very reason for him wanting an army and a campaign was political. He had seen others rise to great power by having an army behind them. And this was what it was all about for Caesar. His conquest of Gaul was incidental to actually gaining power at Rome. His whole aim was to establish him as the most powerful citizen in Rome. To conquer Gaul would mean defeating 60 major tribes with a combined population of many millions. Caesar determined to do so, one by one. Before embarking on campaign, however, Caesar had to find an excuse, however tenuous, to justify launching an assault outside his provincial territories. A tribe called the Helvetii, migrating south toward his Roman-held lands, gave him that excuse. He entered Gaul and intercepted them. Once in Gaul, 
he had no intention of leaving. By putting his own ambition ahead of Rome's, Caesar risked being recalled from his post, but he knew that as long as he could impress Rome's populace, the Senate would not dare to act. To publicize the image of himself as a great commander, he produced a record of his campaigns. These reports, in which he refers to himself as Caesar, kept Rome informed of the general's progress and, of course, his victories. Of his battle against the Helvetii, he wrote, Caesar, first of all, had his own horse taken out of the way, and then the horses of other officers. Caesar wanted the danger to be the same for everyone, and for no one to have any hope of escape. Then Caesar spoke a few words of encouragement to the men. Hurling their javelins from above, our men easily broke up the enemy's mass formation, and having achieved this, drew their swords and charged. In the end, the wounds and the toil of battle were too much for the Helvetii, and they began to retire to a hill about a mile away. Caesar then turned his attention to securing what would be his eastern border along the River Rhine. He pushed back the German tribes, previously Rome's allies, who had their own ambitions towards Gaul. The following year, 57 BC, having dispatched subordinates to fight elsewhere in Gaul, he headed north. During the march, he was suddenly attacked by the Belgae. Had it not been for the discipline of his troops, Rome might have lost both army and governor. Well, Caesar always had the tremendous personality, the charisma that is necessary in any great general. He had that, but it's quite clear from his own accounts of the early part of his war in Gaul that he was making mistakes and the army was managing to get out of them. I mean, his first three battles were in one way or another errors in judgment. The third one in particular, where he's actually ambushed. You know, it is only the, the sheer guts of the Roman soldier and Caesar's own willingness to go into the front line and fight next to the blokes to inspire them that actually wins the battle. So, I mean, he, is, he does have a great input, but his actual generalship in these early early battles is poor. Rome heard only of his successes, and his reputation grew. After wintering near the borders of Italy to keep informed of political developments, Caesar continued on his quest to subdue Gaul. In 56 BC, he defeated important maritime tribes on the western Atlantic coast. Then the following year, he returned to secure the eastern border on the Rhine. In 55 and then 54 BC, he became the first Roman general to raid Britain. In military terms, the raids were almost disasters, but once again, Rome was impressed by what it heard of his achievements. In Gaul, however, his brutal repression of the population earned him little admiration. In 52 BC, he faced a new challenge. Under the leadership of a prince called Vercingetorix, an alliance of Gallic tribes decided to expel, once and for all, the Roman invaders. Vercingetorix knew that Caesar's strategy was dependent on keeping Roman supply routes open. And Vercingetorix told his men, we must strive by every means to prevent the Romans from obtaining forage and supplies. This will be easy, since we are strong in cavalry and the season is in our favor. Along the enemy's line of march, we must burn all the villages and farms within the radius that their foragers can cover. The Romans will either succumb to starvation or have to expose themselves to serious risk by going far from their camp. This policy was only partly successful and both generals realized that the outcome would have to be decided by direct confrontation. The battle that was to decide the future of Gaul was fought here, 
at Elise saint ren then known as Elysia. Caesar would be massively outnumbered, simultaneously confronting two fierce armies. Against such odds, how did he emerge victorious? Whatever the sacrifice involved, his determination to rule Gaul and one day Rome never wavered. He put enormous energy into all his tasks. Where others would journey 50 miles a day, Caesar would travel 100. His workload amazed his contemporaries. He simply refused to allow himself to be beaten. Caesar was the most skillful swordsman and horseman and showed surprising powers of endurance. He always led his army more often on foot than in the saddle, went bareheaded in the sun and the rain alike, and could travel for long distances at incredible speed, taking very little luggage. If he reached an unfordable river, he'd either swim or propel himself across on an inflated skin, and often arrived at his destination before the messengers that he'd sent ahead to announce his approach. Roman and Gallic armies fought minor engagements in preparation for the deciding battle. Caesar besieged Vercingetorix at Gergovia, but an attempt to storm the city resulted in heavy Roman losses. Then Vercingetorix and his 80,000 soldiers set up camp at the hill town of Elysia, where they felt equally safe. When Caesar arrived in the valley below, he saw why. He was confronted with an invulnerable hill, a natural fortress. The sides were too steep for direct assault. Caesar went ahead of his troops and rode to the top of a nearby hill. He looked at his foe, established around and behind the town opposite. He had two choices, to retreat or lay siege. But a siege would be a mammoth undertaking, involving the encirclement of the entire area. The determination to succeed made the decision for him. He was facing, and before Elysia, a very complex and difficult situation. There was this massive revolt of almost all the Gallic tribes under a very gifted commander of Asengetorix, and indeed, it had a setback or two in the lead up to this battle. So here we have Caesar having to regain the moral dominance in the situation, which was possibly flowing perhaps in the enemy's direction at this particular time. But once again, he was going to take such bold decisions by heading for the center of the power of the Gallic revolt, the fortress of Elysia, to win all by risking all in this one great battle. The Roman army could not always rely on its commanders. The political background of Roman generals was no guarantee of expertise in war. Well, political and military command was completely integrated because the senior military commanders were themselves also the senior politicians of the Roman state. This goes right the way back to the beginnings of Roman history, when Roman aristocrats were themselves citizen soldiers who led the army in battle. Uh, and the Romans never, until very late in imperial times, about 300 years after the time of Julius Caesar, developed a separate professional officer corps. Right the way through the expansion of the Roman Empire and during its height, the uh, army command remained carried out by senior politicians, and it was a part of their normal career function. Caesar, in charge of 70,000 soldiers, had relatively little experience of command before invading Gaul. What he lacked in technical ability, he made up for with ambition and drive. Certainly in relation to the, to the commanders of the ancient world, their great thing really is to plan the overall strategy, to get the army to the place it should be, to choose the battlefield. This is the important thing. To get there as Caesar does and Alexander does so quickly that the enemy is unprepared for them. But from that point on, they have to delegate responsibility to, their, to people much further down scale 
because the actual fighting is done by small groups of men operating together, and the overall command is very limited. Caesar was fortunate. He could rely on an army whose drill, discipline and fighting ability, as well as its skill at fortification and engineering, were without comparison. We are now in the period of the sophisticated military machine. By that I mean, of course, the Roman Legion, which is by far the most sophisticated organization for fighting wars that had been seen to date, and indeed would not be really rivaled until the times of Napoleon and his army corps system, many centuries ahead. The great advantages of the Legion were its flexibility. It was a miniature army, something like 7,000 men, the average Legion is supposed to have been, but it had its own infantry, which was the basis, its own cavalry, its own artillery, artillery in the terms of that period, of course, and it had its own staff, its own direction. Now, because of its innate strength, so we say, it was able, the Roman military machine, that is to say, to make up any deficiencies in its generalship of the highest command. They were so good. In the 150 years before the time of Caesar, they had virtually not changed at all in their fighting system. They are unique as an army in that the individual soldier fought with a sword. Now that makes him unique, and it wasn't even a slashing sword, it was a thrusting sword used underarm like this. And he fought at very, very close range, eyeball to eyeball. It fitted the Italian characteristics very, very much. They were, the Italians have this, or the Italians at Roman, in Roman times, had this infinite capacity for hard work. They had a tremendous resilience. They could suffer a defeat and still recover and fight back. And this is the, is the great asset of the Roman army, that you can give them an almost impossible task to do, and they will do it, where many other armies would just give up and say it's not possible and it shows up very, very well in the Siege of Elysia. If Caesar could defeat Vercingetorix, Gaul would finally be his. It was a daunting challenge, but with his army, he was sure it could be done. First, he spread his troops in eight main bases around the hill. Vercingetorix whose army would face starvation if he allowed himself to be encircled, launched a preemptive cavalry attack, but it was repulsed. To prevent further cavalry attacks, the Romans dug a deep trench between the rivers on either side of the hill. Then they worked to construct in a matter of days a defensive cordon 11 miles long. As Caesar did not have enough men to defend its entire length, he ordered the installation of deadly obstacles behind rows of metal spikes and sharpened stakes designed to cripple men and horses, they dug two further trenches, one of them flooded. The earth from the trenches formed a 12-foot wall on which they built a wooden fence dominated by towers. If it worked, it would be at best impenetrable. At worst, it would delay an individual assault long enough for Caesar to send extra troops to repel it. He knew that Vercingetorix had sent for urgent reinforcements, and so he set about building a second defensive cordon, facing outwards. This one was an enormous 14 miles long. There is a, a very interesting comment by a later Roman general called Corbulo, who says that more campaigns are won by the Delabra, this is the Roman entrenching tool, than by the sword. And this is the essence of the Roman siege technique, they just keep at it, they will not give up. And the enemy often knew that if the Romans had surrounded them, they'd had it, because the Romans would not give up. And many, many sieges were over before they'd even started for this very reason. But Vercingetorix didn't know this. He thought he could win, and he was wrong. And if he'd known the Romans better, he'd have known he was wrong. Vercingetorix's reinforcements arrived. Even tribes which Caesar had recently beaten and allied with Rome sent troops. Caesar claimed that over 250,000 extra men now faced him from beyond his outer lines. 
This massive Gallic army set up camp on a hill a mile away, their cavalry positioned at their front on the plain. Caesar ordered his soldiers to prepare for battle. The next day, the Gallic army outside the line sent its cavalry to launch an attack. Vercingetorix, who could not communicate with the Gauls outside, reacted by sending troops to fill in the trench nearest Elysia. The fighting lasted all day, but by sunset, the Romans had forced the Gauls to retreat. The following evening, the Gallic army outside the lines waited until midnight before launching a renewed assault on the defenses. Vercingetorix also sent men down from Alesia to attack Caesar's inner line. The Romans faced fierce onslaughts in front and behind them. It was too dark to see, and casualties were heavy on both sides. The generals, who had been detailed for the defense of this particular sector, reinforced the points where they knew the troops were hard-pressed, with men brought up from well behind the fighting line. But Caesar's defenses were effective. Hundreds of Gauls were impaled on the obstacles or killed by javelins and arrows fired from the ramparts. By dawn, the attack was called off. Both Gallic armies were low on supplies and had little choice but to carry on fighting or accept defeat. The Gallic army outside the lines decided to focus its attention on the Roman camp at the foot of a small hill north of Elysia. During the night, tens of thousands of troops were sent around the back of the hill and the next morning launched a surprise assault. At the same time, some of the army attacked on the plain. Vercingetorix saw what was happening and sent his men to other points of the encirclement to divide and weaken the Roman forces. Caesar was facing an all-out assault. Defeat would mean death. Distributed as they were along lines of such length, the Romans found it difficult to meet simultaneous attacks in many different places. They were unnerved too by the shouts they could hear behind them as they fought, which indicated that their lives were not in their own hands, but depended on the bravery of others. It is nearly always invisible dangers that are most terrifying. I think we see in Caesar a man who was um, physically very tough, who endured hardships with his soldiers, uh, who was greatly admired by his soldiers because he set an example to them, and who, um, rather like the Duke of Wellington, always seemed to manage to be at the right time, at the right place in a battle. Uh, in that sense, he was a great tactician, perhaps uh, a greater tactician than a strategist. And so, although he did certainly make mistakes and was sometimes surprised, he had so much confidence in his own ability as a commander. And he was such a brave and physically tough man that he was able to, to intervene, uh, to restore situations, to calm the nerves of his soldiers confronted by wild Gallic tribes or, or wild Britons and somehow turn a situation of crisis uh, to his advantage. Well, I think the secret of Caesar's generalship was very much his personal leadership and the close relationship he had with his soldiers who obviously loved him personally. Although he's famed for the beautiful quality of his Latin when he's writing, I suspect that he was capable of talking bawdy with his soldiers. Uh, and also, he was someone who was prepared to rough it in the field with them. He's supposed to have eaten normal soldiers' rations and to have slept on the ground and to have forded rivers himself. So he very much led from the front, literally in some battles. He was in the front line on foot, having sent his horse away. So this was a sort of uh, example that he set for his soldiers, which encouraged them very strongly to follow him. 
Though turning a blind eye to much of their misbehavior, he allowed no deserter or mutineer to escape severe punishment. Sometimes, if victory had been complete enough, they relieved the troops of all military duties and let them carry on as wildly as they pleased. One of his boasts was, my soldiers fight just as well when they're stinking of perfume. Napoleon, of course, was a great admirer of Caesar and took his commentaries with him on campaign. The reason for that, I'm pretty sure, is he likes a way in which Caesar takes decisions and keeps a grip on the men and his subordinate commanders. Here you have a commander who's not always right in the things he decides to do, but my word, he's certainly in control of a situation. That, I think, is the greatest single strength of Julius Caesar as a soldier. The situation was critical. Caesar found a good observation point from which he could follow the actions in every part of the field and send help where it was needed. At first, Caesar stayed at his camp, watching the proceedings and dispatching troops. Then he rushed to all parts of the line, encouraging his troops, telling them that all they had previously fought for depended on this day's battle. The Gauls had succeeded in pulling down a part of the stockade near Caesar's camp. Caesar sent relief troops, then more, and finally rushed to fight in person until the attack was successfully repulsed. He could see that his troops were weakening against the main Gallic assault to the north, and he sent the order that all his cavalry should leave the defenses and attack the Gauls from the rear. Caesar, during the, these attacks, the last days of the siege, Caesar is there always, and always willing to go anywhere he's needed. His main input in this is inspiration. Wherever the lines are pushed hard, Caesar is there encouraging the troops, sending up reinforcements, showing the troops that he is there, that he will suffer the same as they do, that he isn't hiding away somewhere where he can't be got. This is, is the great thing about Caesar when it actually comes to it. He is willing to be in the front line, actually fighting, if necessary, to inspire his troops. And this is his great asset, in spite of the fact he's not as young as most commanders. I mean, you're talking about a man nearing 50 here. He is willing to be there with them fighting. And it is this, he wears a scarlet cloak so that people can see when he's around, so that he inspires them at the last the last final throw of the, of the Gauls against the defences. The tr Roman troops see Caesar coming. They see him riding down between the lines, his red cloak flowing in the breeze. And he, he tells us a great cheer goes up and they find renewed vigour. It, it, this is the point, it's the inspiration. These troops have been fighting for hours and hours and hours. Yet Caesar's own presence there gives them the renewed vigour to throw the Gauls out. And that is the point of victory. The armies fought man to man. Napoleon, centuries later, wrote there is a moment in an engagement when the least maneuver is decisive and gives victory. It is the one drop of water which makes the cup run over. When Caesar's horsemen suddenly appeared to their rear, the Gauls launching the main attack panicked. This panic turned into a retreat and retreating armies, frightened and disorganized, are easy prey. It was the turning point of the battle. News traveled swiftly along the lines, and soon all other Gallic assaults had been called off. Only the encroaching darkness saved the lives of the fleeing Gauls. The battle was over. Caesar had successfully defended 25 miles of entrenchment and beaten two armies, who, combined, had outnumbered him by at least five to one.
Alesia is, in my opinion, Caesar's greatest achievement on the military sphere. Well, he only had 70,000 troops. He was already outnumbered in carrying out the siege. But then this huge quarter of a million strong relief army of Gauls begins to make his presence felt. What does Caesar do? He does not break off the siege. He orders his men to dig a second series of entrenchments, something like 14 miles of them this time, around the other entrenchments, and puts his own army, as you might say, as the meat between the two pieces of bread in the sandwich. He's got the Gauls inside Elysia, and he's got this huge relief army beyond his own lines. Then the great battles which then develop, you find him controlling the situation with the very greatest of skill. Usually from the back, keeping an overall view on what is going on, but then intervening in person when he saw a really major crisis had emerged and needed his personal presence. So you find him, therefore, taking on almost impossible odds, one would think, in this battle. Some would say possibly a little rashly. But nevertheless, by the sheer skill of his command techniques and so forth, and his idea of how this very difficult situation could be mastered, bringing off one of the great military successes of classical history. The next day, Vercingetorix surrendered. He was offered no pity. Chained up like an animal, he was led off to be paraded through the streets of Rome, where, years later, he was ritually strangled during one of Caesar's triumphant celebrations. Caesar, while at times the image of a charming nobleman, could be entirely ruthless. Every action was motivated by political calculation whether it was the granting of mercy or the sentence of death. All the military and civilian prisoners taken at Elysia were distributed among the Roman soldiers and the slave traders that accompanied them. In 51 BC, the Gallic tribal chiefs were assembled and finally forced by Caesar to accept Roman rule. Gaul was conquered. But Caesar's ambition was to control Rome. He took his armies to Italy itself and engaged in civil war with his old ally, Pompey. Pompey's army was composed of old soldiers and raw recruits. Caesar and his toughened veterans were able to defeat them in a number of battles in Italy, Greece, Spain and North Africa. In 45 BC, the Senate, now at Caesar's mercy, offered him dictatorship a constitutional device employed in times of crisis. Caesar returned to Rome in triumph. He reveled in his victory and laid on huge celebrations, gladiatorial combats, lion hunts, a naval battle on a specially flooded campus, and, as a grand finale, two armies of war captives and criminals fighting each other to the death. But in the streets and markets of Rome, some refused to rejoice over a destructive civil war. Worse discontent followed as Caesar increasingly assumed the airs of a king, renaming a month July in his honor and bringing his lover, Queen Cleopatra, from Egypt with her son, Caesarion. Some of the Senate were feeling increasingly ignored. Rumors spread of plots to kill the mighty Caesar. He knew his life was in danger, but he declined a bodyguard, declaring, it is better to die once than to live always in fear of death. On the 15th of March, 44 BC, only days before he intended to head east with new armies, the great general who had fought on so many battlefields was stabbed to death in a small room behind a theater killed in Rome by Romans. The state was thrown into chaos until Augustus, Caesar's adopted nephew, took power and became the first Roman emperor. Among the potential rivals he had assassinated 
was Caesar's only son. Well, on the one hand, Caesar destroyed by violence the rising civilization of the Gauls themselves, which is one of the great might have beens of European history. On the other hand, in its place grew up a Gallo-Roman civilization, a mixture of Gaulish and Roman, which became one of the great glories of Roman history. It led to the land of France being dotted with beautiful classical cities and the countryside holding thousands of Roman villas. It became a very wealthy land and became, in economic and military terms, the kingpin of the Western Roman